Um, thank you all for joining us today um, on this presentation for the Australian Framework for the Ethical Co-Production of Research and Evaluation with Victim Survivors. Um, as mentioned, the seminar is being recorded, um, and I'm just going to invite you to put yourselves on mute if you haven't done so already. Um, at the end of this presentation, um, I will also invite you to put questions into the chat, um, and I'll be moderating a, a Q&A with our presenters today. So um, I would like to open this event by acknowledging the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea, and community. I pay my respects to elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples here today. Uh, I am on Wurundjeri country in Narm, Melbourne, and I invite you to acknowledge the country you are on in the chat and the places you are joining us from today. I know we've got folks from all over Australia and maybe even some people from outside of Australia. So it'd be great to know where you are. Um, I would also like to acknowledge survivors of domestic family and sexual violence. And I would like us all to keep at the forefront of our minds those who have experienced family violence or other forms of abuse and the right we all have to live free from violence. Let us take care of each other in the session today. And please, if you need assistance for yourself or someone in your life, contact 1-800-RESPECT. I will put that contact information in the chat when the presentation begins. Um, I will just quickly introduce our wonderful presenters before I hand the session over to them. Um, and they can tell them you have a little bit more about themselves as well. So we have um, Dr. Katie Lamb. Uh, Katie is a co-design research fellow in the Safer Family Center of Research Excellence at the University of Melbourne. And Katie works with the Weavers who are lived experience co-researchers. Katie has a background in criminology and public policy and a passion for issues which sit at the interface between child and family welfare and criminal justice systems, including family violence. Lula Dembele is a Safer Family Center weaver and the co-author of the framework presented in the seminar today. Lula is an expert in gender relations and systems change and passionately supports people who have survived childhood sexual abuse and domestic violence. Lula works hard to make sure that our society changes to prevent and reduce violence by men against women and children. And we have Lily Fetter, who coordinates and supports the Weavers team and is a weaver herself, as well as a social justice campaigner, advocate, and a midwife. As a midwife, she has a keen interest in women's rights, in pregnancy and childbirth, and the impact of family violence on these life experiences, and improving health sector responses. So I will now invite Katie, Lula, and Lily to present the framework. Thank you. Thanks so much, Erin. Just give us a moment to share our slides. No worries. Fabulous. Thanks for that really warm introduction. Lily and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land that we are on today, the lands of the Wurundjeri people, um, and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging and any Aboriginal people here in the room today with us and acknowledge that the land that we are on here is never ceded. Um, we would also like to acknowledge victim survivors as well and the strength and resilience and the beauty that they bring to the work that we do. Um, and thanks so much for having us here today. We're really pleased to be here to talk about some of the work that we've been doing um, and fabulous to have both Lily and Lula here um, as well. So um, really excited to be talking about the framework um, and really looking forward to having a significant amount of time for questions and discussion at the end of the session. Um, so I, I will hand over to Lily now to give a bit of an introduction to who the Weavers are. So the Weavers are a group of women with lived experience of domestic family and sexual violence. They were established in 2016 and we embed lived experience into the work of the Save a Family Centre at the University of Melbourne and we support a wide range of university research projects and um, on a more and on an increasing basis um, requests from external organizations as well. 
So I guess um, we also thought it was useful to give a bit of insight into the background infrastructure that supports the weavers. It's not something that we often do a lot of talking about, but I think it's really important that we do um, because it's a key element of um, why our program has been um, going for so long is because the back of house work that um, people do to make sure that the group is well supported. So the weavers are led by a steering group of um, survivors who are, have been members of the weavers group for some time. Um, they meet monthly to determine the direction and talk about issues as they crop up and set the kind of strategic directions and, and make policies for the group as well. Um, the other back of house function that we have is we have um, emotional support and peer support provided to members of the group. Um, we're lucky to have a women's counsellor in our team who provides that support. Um, it's a really important element of our work. Um, plus, we also have very significant logistical payment administrative coordination provided. Um, a member of the Weavers Group provides that um, each year, and at the moment that role is filled by Lily. Um, but we've also had um, we've also had other members of the Weavers um, do that work in the past. We've had um, Kelly and, and Sharon also have done that work, and at the moment Lily's um, doing that role. And it's a really crucial piece of. Um, support that the weavers have um, to make sure that everybody gets where they need to be at the right time. Everybody's been got the reading they need to do. Everyone's clear about what they're doing. Everybody's getting paid for their time and knows how to go about that. Um, any issues that crop up, um, people know to contact Lily and that will be um, and we'll, that will get resolved. So it's a really important role that that administrator provides. The group also receives research support. So we found that that's how things work best. Even when we're doing external projects, our team provides uh, research support around um, a particular project. So we work as a team. Um, I think there's sometimes a misunderstanding that people can ring us and rent out some survivors. So I'll have two survivors next Tuesday for two hours and that's not really how it works. It's not how it works best. That's not supportive. So our co-design team is very much a team. We work together. We support each other. We bring different strengths um, to the work and work best when we work together. The other element of support the weavers receive is skill building. Um, so we offer training and professional development, opportunities to attend conferences and speak at conferences and further study. And, you know, this is an area where we'd love to do more. Um, the resources we have sort of uh, contain what we can do, but we've got grand plans um, and it's something we really we really value in our group and look for opportunities to, to um, offer more experiences and opportunities um, to the group of women that we have. So we now have 36 weavers and we all contribute um, on different levels to um, a broad range of activities including setting the research agenda for the centre. So we've been involved with planning days and involved with Delphi surveys. Um, we establish uh, research projects on agreed areas of interest. We co-design and co-facilitate, sorry, can't speak today, co-facilitate workshops, panels and conference presentations. We conduct focus groups and interviews as part of the qualitative research. We contribute to the development and delivery of teaching and training at the University of Melbourne. And we support a range of commissioned work, research projects, evaluations and policy development. So we've developed um, two key frameworks for best practice for survivor engagement. The um, first one we developed back in 2020 was the Family Violence Expert by Experience Framework. And this particular framework is for engagement of victim survivors in policy and practice. The second one, which is the one we're mostly speaking to today, is the Australian Framework for the Ethical Co-Production and Research of Research and Evaluation with Victim Survivors of Domestic Family and Sexual Violence. Um, and this particular framework uh, is for the engagement of victim survivors in policy and practice. So both of these are available on the Safer Families website. We can pop the link in the chat. So as Lily said, today we're going to focus on our research and evaluation framework. Um, this project was co-funded by the Safer Family Centre at the University and the World Health Organisation. Um, and it was co-designed with three Weaver members, um, Fiona, Lula, who's here today, and Nina. Um, and 
with the import of a much larger group of weavers, to be fair, over a period of time, they were the three co-authors and other weavers really contributed significant components as the project went on over the course of the year. Um, and it was, you know, a fabulous experience of being involved in that process, which really the weavers really led. Um, so the aim of the framework is to support researchers and victim survivors wanting to engage in co-produced research and evaluations about domestic family and sexual violence. That was our aim. So why did we need a framework? Um, you know, there were a range of reasons we thought we needed a framework. There seemed to be a lack of clarity about what constitutes co-produced research or evaluations in our sector. Um, a lot of confusion around that, what co-production actually means. What did exist, the guidance we could find, was really high-level theory, a lot of principles and theory-level things that we could refer to, but nothing about how to do this work in practice. It was something that we had longed for because we would have liked the guidance ourselves, um, but we couldn't find it. So we thought we could contribute to that, um, particularly around the practicalities. Um, there's also a real lack of understanding we, we felt around how co-production differs to consultation. We found that a lot of people were using those terms interchangeably um, and that was problematic for us because just calling something co-design doesn't make it so and there, there are some significant differences between the two and there'll be many people in this room that are really familiar with those kind of nuanced differences. Um, we also found that some researchers were a bit fearful about engaging in co-production. It was a bit mysterious. So one of our aims was to demystify what we were talking about. So it wasn't this inaccessible concept that was really tricky. We wanted to make it really grounded um, and so that people would feel more comfortable approaching it. And that's why we have developed the resources that we have to get people started. Um, I guess also we were aware that people didn't often came to us saying, I've tried co-production with survivors and it went really badly. And we would, you know, often say, well, what happened? What did you do? And the key thing, one of the consistent things we heard was that there wasn't that wraparound support, that infrastructure that I've talked about that the weavers have, and we'll talk more about. Um, the absence of that wraparound infrastructure, particularly emotional support, peer support, um, administrative support, which is really underestimated around the importance of that. Um, you know, if those things aren't present, then I th we feel like, you know, sometimes people are setting out um, to, to fail because, you know, they haven't got those protections in place because they haven't thought about it. Um, so that was something we wanted to bring attention to. We wanted to share our experiences of both what works and what doesn't. We've got heaps of experience of both um, things that have worked really well that we've tried, things that we've worked, that we've done that have been disasters. And I think it's really important and we're really happy to be transparent about that and share both examples. Um, and our group um, is quite reflective and, and does often um, call out things where things haven't worked and unpack why that has been the case. And I guess the main reason and, and one of the reasons we're here today is we're really keen to start a conversation with others doing this work. There's probably people here today that have been doing this work that we probably haven't connected with and we'd love to um, because it's, you know, it's a complex area. It's ethically challenging. It's logistically challenging. Um, there's not a guidebook. So we're really happy to be part of that conversation and really welcome anyone who wants to talk with us further to reach out and connect with us. Um, that'd be really fantastic. That'd be a great outcome for us from today. So one of the things the framework did was lay out, um, try and, I guess, uh, describe some of the terminology that we're using. And I think it's really important to say that uh, we're really open to this uh, this document and this framework being a living document and we've already modified it quite a bit when we published it we uh, put the draft on for public consultation onto the web um, and got public consultation for more than six months so and we did change a lot based on what people said and so I guess when I'm starting to talk about some of the definitions and terms in the framework I just want to be really clear that not everybody agrees with everything um, as is the case um, in most work in this space there's differences of opinion we've tried to um, encompass as many people's perspectives as we could um, so I guess one of the key concepts in the framework is this idea that you know the most high quality research teams bring together expertise from a diverse range of backgrounds, whether that's academic expertise, um, expertise by experience, um, that everything is valued in our team and the more different forms of expertise we can have in a team, the better it is. And that's a key element of the framework. Um, we have all different types of expertise in our team. Um, we've grouped them into three kind of 
um, I guess, I want to say categories because people fit into more than one of these definitions and we're really clear that people define themselves and some people will be in one of these boxes, some people will be in three of these boxes, some people will choose to be in one and then at a different point in their career will choose to be in another and some people will feel like they fit across kind of all of them and that's all fine. Um, we're really happy for people to define themselves but we have developed these terms so that we can kind of make sense of what we're talking about and who we're talking about. Um, so we've, you know, defined academic researchers as a person with research qualifications and experience who's employed because of those that uh, research qualifications and experience. But we're really clear that academic researchers can have lived experience or they may not, and they may choose to disclose that or they may not. So, you know, academic researchers can fit into all those categories. Um, but as a general rule, they have those qualifications and backgrounds. A lived experience researcher also has research qualifications and experience, um, but they've been recruited into a role that's designed for those with lived experience and where bringing a lived experience lens to make is a major part of their job. Um, so they've been hired to do that work um, and that's a major part of their, their job. Um, some academic researchers with lived experience also choose to identify as a lived experience researcher. We have um, people who fit into that kind of description in our team as well, but it really depends on the individual's kind of uh, employment arrangements and situations. So, you know, again, up to the individual, how they define and where they place themselves or see themselves. And then we have victim survivor co-researchers. So these are our Weaver members who have lived experience of domestic family and sexual violence and who work as co-researchers alongside academic researchers and lived experience researchers. And as I said, we have um, people who fit into all these groups in our team and, and some people move between the, the um, teams or depending on the environment that they're in, how they, term, how they um, describe themselves. The other key element that we defined in the framework was this continuum, and this will be a really familiar kind of concept for most people where participation is described as along a continuum from low levels of um, engagement through to more uh, high levels of engagement and that co-production end. Um, we couldn't find an existing continuum that really summed up uh, what we needed for our particular framework. So you'll see that it's pretty familiar. It's been lots of these elements have been taken from other uh, kind of continuums, but we've modified them for our purposes. Um, so at one end of the continuum, we have participation. So that's where victim survivors are as part of an evaluation. For example, they're interviewed and asked about a certain element of a particular service, for example, asked how that service was for them, what they found. That's what we're talking about with participate. Then we've got advise and collaborate where survivors are involved in uh, more comprehensively in certain elements of a project. And then in the co-production end, it's where survivors are really involved in all aspects of that research or evaluation, right from the start all the way through to dissemination. The difference between co-design and co-creation Co-design, usually survivors are engaged once a topic is picked or it's loosely defined, then a project set up and survivors are engaged at that point. Co-creation is where the survivors and the researchers come up with the project from a very scratch spot together um, from initiation. So they're the differences. And, you know, obviously there are some infrastructure challenges around co-creation versus co-design, funding grants, all that sort of thing. And really happy to talk to people more about our experiences around that. Uh, we have had experiences of research projects in the co-creation space and a lot in the co-design space. So we've our projects fit into both of those categories and, and sometimes down the lower ends as well. I think the key message we want to give around the continuum is the fact that there's no, you know, that's a bad end, that's the good end, any judgment around that. I think the key message we would get across is that it's about clarity and transparency. So if you've got really small um, amount of money, you've got really tight timelines, then advise and collaborate might be where is reasonable to do. If you aimed to do co-design or co-production, you know, you might be doing it really tokenistically or really poorly or unethically because you haven't got the funds. So I think being really clear about that is, you know, we've done this level because that's what could be done in the timelines. I think that's, you know, we don't have a problem or judgment around that, but just being really clear and really transparent about what you've done um, and why you've done it, I think, um, is the key message. I'm going to hand over to Lily to talk about the framework content. So our framework provides uh, best practice principles um, for co-produced research with victim survivors. There's about a dozen of them, and due to time limitations, I can't go into a lot of detail for all of them. But just briefly, um, they are agency, transparency, healing informed, safety and support, researcher preparedness, 
mutual exchange, recognise and value, comfort with discomfort, relationships, inclusion, individualised and flexibility, accountability, and I think that wraps them all up. And probably the most important thing about these is to think about how these principles will be put into practice. Again, our framework does provide some um, examples. Uh, I can't go through them all right now, but um, certainly take the time. I recommend page seven is where they start. Um, um, but as we discuss these principles, you'll note that many of them overlap and intersect. Putting time into planning and preparation, you can often identify and navigate any challenges or barriers that you may face when co-producing research. And that will help the project run smoothly if you can pre-troubleshoot the problems before they even arise. Um, for us at The Weavers, we've actually designed a very brief guide to working with the University of Melbourne Weavers. It's just a two-page document that briefly uh, provides a brief overview of the weavers, how um, we expect communication to be handled. So for the most part, um, for, from a safety point of view, communication all comes through either myself or, or Katie. Uh, we don't share, for example, email addresses, um, and that's just for safety. Um, we The, the uh, guide to working with weavers discusses um, any preparation, what the expectation is, if there's pre-reading, um, what time frame that needs to be um, provided in. Um, we talk about what support the weavers have, um, engagement, um, uh, and with regards to engagement, we make it clear that our weavers are not expected to tell their story. Um, we're not here just to tell a story. We're about here to use our lived experience from our lived experience um, to create change, to change policies, to, to change practice. Um, our brief guide uh, also talks about payment and how that will that process will happen. Um, it talks about conferences and publications and um, concerns or issues. So if at any point in the project there's a problem, how to manage that. Um, so that is a document we provide at the beginning of a project when it's about to start. Once we have um, a full understanding of, of the project or the research, we then advertise that in our monthly newsletter that goes out to all our weavers. Our weavers then have a read um, and opt in to a project if it suits them. Um, and then once we um, have a look at who has expressed interest, we then um, select the weavers that are um, either haven't had an opportunity yet or who might have a specific lived experience that speaks really strongly to that research project. And at that point, we get the weavers themselves to fill out a one-page form, which is a, um, a form we call specific information about the weavers. And that's where that weaver gets the opportunity to provide the project lead with information that's important for them, for, for, the, for you to know about them. So they might let you know that they want to go by an alias name. Um, they might let you know of disabilities they have or groups that they um, are participants in. They'll let you know if they're happy for the, um, any workshops to be recorded, whether that be audio and or video recorded, um, how they might deal with stress um, and how they'd like to provide you feedback. Um, we know that different weavers and different people have different strengths. So some people are better uh, with verbal communication communication, which I'm not really doing very well with today. Um, and some are better and prefer to provide written communication. Um, so, uh, yeah, so if I just speak briefly to some of um, the um, principles here, things like some of the, my awareness and my experience in this sort of space has you know, alerted me to the fact that sometimes there's hesitancy to engage with lived experience. There's this fear of re-traumatising people. Um, but something that I think is important to share is that 
And I even read this on a um, website recently, don't quote me, I think was the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare. They sort of found that at any point in time, 75% of our population will experience some sort of trauma during their lifetime. So that's most of us. And not that it's ever okay to re-traumatise someone, but people as a general rule are actually, and especially victim survivors, they're actually very skilled at managing their trauma. They have very good supports in place, especially within groups like the Weavers and where we're guided by these best practice principles. So um, I guess that's something, a message that I just want to send that you don't need to fear working with survivors um, yeah, so I think we're on to the next slide. Is that you? Yeah. Thanks, Sully, for sort of, I guess, giving some examples about how these principles play out in the practice and the way that we run our group. Um, so I guess I wanted to just explore a little bit about what some of these principles mean for evaluators, specifically, given that focus of the discussion today. So if we think about the principles um, and, you know, really welcome everybody to have a look at the principles in full, um, the Weavers wrote the principles and they're incredibly um, well written and really I think the examples are really valuable. Um, so I guess if we think about agency, um, we're talking about setting up processes where victim survivors make their own decisions about suitability to participate and the support they need. Um, I know that putting in ethics applications and things at times with evaluations, we've got pushback around, well, what, what screening tools are you using? How are you screening survivors to see if they're suitable? How are you working out who's eligible? Um, these kind of concepts. And we really push back on that. And exactly as Lily just said, survivors are the best place to know their own safety, to know when it's right for them to participate. Um, so the approach that we take is uh, asking survivors to self-reflect. And there's a tool in our framework that is a series of self-reflection questions for survivors interested in doing co-design work, um, where survivors can reflect on, is this the right time for me to do this? Does my participation impact anyone else in my family? Have I thought that through? Um, have I got uh, support in place, those kind of things. But again, the concept is that survivors make their own decisions. We don't. Um, we allow them to make their decisions. And so that's a really important element of agency. Um, I think evaluation teams need to think about whether they are ready and prepared to work very differently and be power aware before they engage in this type of work. And this type of work isn't for everybody. It's not for all researchers and evaluators. Um, it's not for people who really like the black and the white, the researcher and the participant, um, because everything's in the grey area with co-design. And, you know, I think that's really important that researchers reflect on whether that's an area that will suit them, um, whether they see power. Um, you know, I think really comes down to individual differences. Some people are really power aware. It might be because of their background. It might be because of the study that they've done or the places they've worked. Um, some people will see power really easily um, and we notice that um, and other people just don't don't see it needs something they need to learn to think to look for um, so we've also got a series of um, and this was the weaver suggestion that we also ask researchers to self-reflect before they participate in co-production with survivors think about um, whether they are ready to work very differently um, because, you know, co-design is a very different way of working um, and it does require a lot of flexibility and not everybody's um, comfortable with that. So that's an important element too. Um, I think if we think about leading into this concept of flexibility, um, we've got to make sure that the approach adopted by an evaluator and funder can accommodate, accommodate different people, their working styles, preferences and timelines. And Lily was just talking that a little bit about some people prefer to do things verbally in our group. Some people prefer to do things in written form. Some people prefer to come to a meeting to talk about things. Other people want to be left alone to write their own responses. So um, making sure that the approach that's adopted by the evaluator does have that flexibility built in and isn't too rigid and also that the funder is also flexible. If you've got a really um, uh, outcome-oriented funder um, that wants everything done exactly the way it's written in the contract, that's going to be really difficult too. So I think having those conversations with funders up front about, you know, we're, we're adopting an approach that's flexible, that there's going to need to be some flexibility from your side as well, I think is a really important conversation to have at the start of a project. I think um, also a mindset shift is needed from that how can I prevent survivors being upset and harmed to how can I make sure this process is beneficial and contributes to well-being and that's the healing informed principle in our framework. Um, 
I think this is a discussion we have with ethics committees quite a bit, and there's probably people in this group that have also had to have that discussion. But, you know, as Lily said, really, um, you know, clearly, uh, you know, a lot of survivors do find being part of this type of work really empowering and really beneficial to them um, and almost transformative. And we've got, you know, there's a significant amount of research evidence that that's the case, and we've got um, a reasonable amount documented from our group as well. So I think really pushing back on ethics committees absolute obsession with safety which is very important safety is very important but you know so is um, looking at ways to enhance well-being and being healing informed is really important too and I think the key one of the key elements of that is the wraparound support that we've talked about making sure that's in place um, and I think the final point is around the importance of genuine relationships and also sustainability of initiatives um, and, you know, for evaluators to ask themselves, how can I engage with survivors in my evaluations in a way that builds relationships and can be sustained beyond the project? It's a really tricky one and one we might want to have a chat about in our question time. But, um, you know, short, sharp engagements that leave survivors kind of a, a loose end at the end might not be the way to go. So really interested to hear people's thoughts about um, the potential for more sustainable um, engagement options. So I guess as a, I guess a final point, there's an important role for evaluators to play in advocating for the conditions necessary to ethically engage victim survivors as partners and co-researchers. At the moment, what we're finding is that funders of research are actually showing a lot of support for lived experience engagement and co-design. But what they're not doing is changing the way they fund research and evaluations. Um, they're not really seeing a role for the funder in supporting the infrastructure. Um, it's all very much about what are the hourly rates that survivors are being paid is what we're getting asked a lot of questions about on a daily basis. And for us, that's not really the right question. The right question is what um, supports are being provided more generally because $10 here an hour seems to be where the argument is and, you know, we're like, but what emotional support is being provided? What peer support? What... Um, you know, sessions are being provided, what capacity building, skills training, because it's what survivors tell us a lot is that a number of survivors, they want to build their skills. Um, and the more skills you have in a research environment, the more tasks you can take on and the high level of engagement you can have. And that's something we're really striving for. Um, people don't just intuitively have research skills. They're things that need to be developed. Um, so whose responsibility is to fund that and provide that capacity building? Um, it's something we're really focused on at the moment is really um, thinking about and, and raising that as an issue um, for discussion as well. It's an important part of co-design is that capacity building. So I've got a couple of questions to kind of leave you with or to start off a bit of a discussion, but really happy to talk about any elements of the framework um, or the practice that anyone's interested in talking about. Um, but some questions for reflection are, where are the opportunities to engage victim survivors in my evaluations? Where can I advocate for victim survivor co-researcher infrastructure to be provided by evaluation commissioners? And how can my engagement with survivors be sustained over time and allow for relationships and peer support to be built? That's us. Happy to really happy to take questions or open the discussion. Thank you so much, Katie and Lily. Really appreciate that presentation. Um, thank you. Yeah, that's great. Um, so yeah, if if people um want to respond to the questions that um Katie and Lily put up on the screen, I'd like to invite you to do that. Um, you can do that in the chat. Um, if you like, if you have any questions for Katie and Lily and Lula um, about the framework or, or, or um, you know, issues around evaluation and working with the victim survivors, please do put those in the chat as well. Um, actually, yeah, we have a question about putting those question prompts in the chat. Would you be able to help us out with that, Katie? Then, yes, please. That would be great. Okay, great. So maybe while folks are thinking of some questions or um, something they'd like to say, um, I just want to pick up on the sustainability question that you put out there, Katie. Um, you know, what are the things that we need to be thinking about in terms of sustainability in the long term um, when we engage survivors potentially into evaluation projects? Is that something you might be able to respond to, Katie uh, or Lily or Lula, around the sustainability issue? Yeah, I mean, I might 
hand to Lula. Lula, do you want to take that one? Yeah. That's the third question. How can my engagement be sustained over time? Oh, sorry if I'm just the quite... Katie kind of um, raised earlier about sustainability. That sometimes these projects are short. You know, the funding yeah. is longer term. Um, but you know, we're yeah. picking things up in a way that you know could end up kind of dropping things a bit. I think. Um... I don't know if this answers the immediate question, but I think the best way to build sustainability is to do projects really well and demonstrate that when you do it well, you get, uh, you know, over and above what you might have got from doing a different methodology. So I think that's a really critical bit. Um, and I think if we build on the evidence base uh, and build on the work and practice that we've been establishing uh, with weavers and through other um, groups and, and locations, then I think that will help us make the case. Um, I have a range of experiences doing this work and I sometimes have, as we just said, a different opinion. We have different opinions. And I think one of the benefits of um, project work is that you're coming together for a specific purpose to apply your lived experience knowledge for a purpose and there's an outcome. Um, there are, I, I really appreciate that way of working. I like being able to see that I've contributed to something and that it's built something or there's a product or, or a per, an outcome at the end. Um, and I, I think it's really critical that the benefits of what that is, is really well shared with the lived experience participants. So I think it, when we're thinking about how we do the work to make it sustainable for um, victim survivors and people who have lived experience of a range of marginalization, but family violence specifically in this context is that the person is somehow better off for having participated in this process. They've either got new, gained new skills, they've made new connections, they've, um, you know, learnt about themselves in a way that or with others that might be revelatory for them you can never define that from the beginning of a process but that's often an outcome um and that you know they haven't incurred a cost um so you have to you know come back to those logistics and think about not only what is the remuneration for someone's time which is a very transactional productivity input in outcome out kind of um focus that we're trying to shift away from but you know, do they have kids? How can they access it? Do you need to cover off on their transport? Um, do you need to cover off on childcare? There's a whole range of considerations for each person that needs to be taken into consideration. And we have to be proactive as organisations doing the work or as researchers and institutions doing the work that we're asking those questions and making those offers. It shouldn't be on the person to have to advocate for themselves, particularly when we're working with people where self-advocacy may have been discouraged or actively stopped and, and prevented for a long time. So the who benefits when and how um, from the beginning of the project, during the project and afterwards, including how it's credited, how um, it's disseminated, who gets acknowledgement for that, um, are really big parts to allowing the sustainability of the movement and the work to continue because we're not exploiting and... Um, you know, uh, draining the resources of the people with lived experience, first and foremost, we're giving back to them. They're getting something out of it. They're not feeling burnt out and used. Um, and I think that's a big piece of their sustainability. Thank you so much for your insights on that, Lula. Um, before I respond, I've got a couple questions in, in the chat. Um, did anyone want to, um, now that Katie's put those questions to you in the chat, did anyone want to respond or reflect on any of the questions that Katie has put in there, which were about the um, where are the opportunities to engage victim survivors in my evaluations? Where can I advocate for victim survivor co-research or infrastructure? Um, and how can my engagement with survivors be sustained over time? Does anyone have any um, kind of burning reflections on that that you want to share with us? All right, so a couple questions in the chat. Um, one question we have is, um, firstly, lots of appreciation for you and the work that you're doing and the thought that you're putting into it. Um, the question is about uh, wondering if you have any experience coming onto projects 
that have had participation, um, hold on, have had participation from victim survivors, but there is interest in increasing co-production any reflection on ways to engage people authentically when you're sort of like half halfway through and might have to like retrofit an existing program to increase the the engagement and the co-production i think you know we're all sitting here thinking well that's not co-production so you know involving people halfway through a project when it's already the directions are determined and things like that they don't meet the criteria of co-production so that's probably not possible. But I guess the things I'm thinking of, projects I've seen have been where something's been done, an evaluation has been done um, and maybe some research has been done It's led to another activity and maybe an outcome of that is um, a certain type of resource needs to be developed and maybe that's where you'd bring the survivors in from the start of the development of that resource or that thing, um, whatever the, the recommendation is, um, bringing survivors to co-design co or co-produce the thing, the training, the workbook, the resources, the intake system, whatever it is that's being redesigned, um, getting survivors at the start of that particular piece and then just being really clear that, you know, the evaluation was done in a traditional kind of using traditional methods, but when it came to development of the resources, the that part of the project is going to be co-designed and just being very clear about that I think um, is one way to I guess increase engagement. Um, can I also say um, I think when you're confronted with those questions go back to the principles mm -hmm. and think about what is the way that this project can now best meet the principles and so I think in that situation you'd be coming back to transparency and be saying really realistically this project is sitting here, you know, go through our questions and our self-reflection and, and thinking about where your project currently sits and articulating, you know, we'd like to have more involvement. Um, what would that look like for you? And that comes back to the agency principle. Like it, the principles are really, really valuable for thinking about what's the next step or how can we continue to try and meet the intent of doing the work ethically, uh, even if we can't resource or we're already partway in and we want to reorient. So I agree with Katie, you need to really understand that that's possibly not going to meet um, your intent of co-production, but to realise where you are and then think about what's the next step that you can actually implement that aligns with the principles to evolve the practice. Great. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we had a question about how can women with lived experience join the waivers? We recruit periodically. Um, we're not recruiting at the moment. We have 36 members. We've just recruited um, a new group. So, um, But when we do recruit, we place a, um advertisement on the Safer Families uh, social media channels. And we are usually inundated with responses yeah. and we usually shut that down about a day or two later. So we get a lot of um, applications when we open up. Um, but, yeah, at the moment, not intending to recruit this year. So I think we're, we've are we just inducted another group of 20, I think, in total into the because obviously people come into the group, leave the group. That's this movement. So um, at the moment we are quite full. <laughs> but so, you never know. Opportunities yeah, come up all the time. Social media. Yeah look out for those opportunities in the future. Katie, is that something people can do is just follow your social media? That'd be the best. Yep. Yep. We'll always pop it up on our social media when we are recruiting. Yep. And it does happen. Yep. Okay, great. Um, a question about acknowledging authorship of uh, co-design, co-creative publications um, with victim survivors, particularly if they don't want to necessarily share their names um, using pseudonyms, um, how does that, you know, is there some complications or ways around the acknowledgement issue? Yeah, so we've got a few weavers who um, don't want their name shared. So they will either choose a, a pseudonym or sometimes they've requested to be um, rec literally recognised as anonymous. So no name at all. So whatever they're comfortable with is is. What happens, yeah. And we check in every time we yeah. do a new publication. Yeah. We do a quick check around with everybody and people change. Sometimes yeah. they want to add their full name. Sometimes yeah. they want to change it to a student. So it's kind of something that changes yeah. over time and we have no problem with that. It's not a, right. not a problem, yeah. Can I come back to agency? Because it's not a question that we should be answering. It's a question you should be asking the people with yeah. lived experience. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Love that. Coming back to that first principle, yeah. Definitely. Thank you, Lula. If you don't know, it's probably best to ask the person. 
Yeah. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, in terms of the, you know, you've now got 36 um, weavers you've recently recruited. Um, there's just some, some questions about the kind of range, I guess, of backgrounds and experiences. Are you able to generally speak to that to, um, you know, provide us a, a sense of, um, you know, uh, I guess the, the broad range, I guess, of, of backgrounds that folks might be coming to you with? Since we've recruited, um, obviously, there's more diversity. So, you know, obviously, everyone who comes into this space has some sort of lived experience of family, domestic or sexual violence. Um, we have, um, you know, we have now, since recruiting, we have a First Nations um, weaver. We have weavers who have experienced elder abuse. We have um, people of LGB communities yeah. um yeah there's there's a broad you know younger weavers older weavers um some with children um some haven't some of them um you know their lived experience have unfortunately gone over many decades um and some have shorter lived experiences um so it's just it's so diverse. variable yeah, yeah really it's variable so diverse, yeah. i mean the advertisement says if you identify as having lived experience of family domestic or sexual violence then they are eligible to apply yeah. and we don't interrogate yeah. that so it's how people define yeah. themselves we've got child people with child who have experienced abuse as children as adults yeah. both but yeah we've yeah. got a very pretty diverse range of experiences yeah. in the group which is great what we know about them is what they want us to know they don't mm -hmm. have to tell us um, um any of the details so long the only criteria really is the family domestic or sexual violence lived experience yeah. that's relevant to the research that we do and that's a key as Ali said earlier that's a key principle of what we this work that we do and something we have to explain to external uh organizations that want to work with us is they often want uh, survivors in the group to um, come and tell their story. We don't do that work. You know, that is our weavers are really clear that that at times weavers may want to tell part of their story or part of their experience. Don't really like to use the word story anymore. It's, mm. It sounds like it's something made up. So that a weaver might want to share a part of their experience um, and that's fine that they, you know, can do that as, as is, you know, as might work in a certain context, but definitely not something that we are going out and asking people to, to share about. It's not really the purpose of the group, as Lily said, it's about their expertise, um, not their particular, um, uh, you know, day-to-day -day experiences and not what we're asking them to share yeah sometimes we need to know some level of details but it's always broad so for example sometimes we've got re we're doing research on um the experience of domestic violence victims in rural communities we obviously need to know that the, the lived experience person we're putting forward has had that experience so we might broadly ask them where where they're located but we don't we don't even know their addresses so very we don't need it we, we don't, don't ask more it. information yeah. than we actually need yeah. so yeah, yeah it's a principle there's a question about um centering young victim survivors perspectives um in genuinely co-produced research you know what are your views on that um experiences with it potentially our group is just adults so we are certainly only working with people over the age of 18 in our group um, there is certainly an interest at the university of setting up a, we call it achievers, a child weavers. Um, certainly that's been discussed. There's a lot of challenges around that, um, including um, getting those groups together, but it's something we would love to. It would need some funding and that's um, something that we need, we would need some funding for, but certainly we would be very interested. And obviously a lot of um, members of our weavers group do have children. So it's something we do talk about a fair bit. Um, yeah, no, it's definitely something we're interested in, but we would need it. I think there's funding. two parts of it as well. Um, myself as a survivor of child sexual abuse, I'm, you know, will use my experience and knowledge of what it was like when I was a child and my, you know, I reach into my feelings as a, as a child and I'm able to um, explain what was, that was like for me at the time. That's not the same as capturing that information with someone who is young and experiencing at the time or very recently experienced at the time, but that is one way um, to include the perspective of young people um, through our history of experience. So I think that they're different, but I think they should both be valued. Um, and, you know, I, I 
from the work I've done over years now with many different people with lived experience, many of us have experienced abuse as children and as adults. So, you know, we we don't separate that um, out. That's part of our lived experience and it has had significant impact on our lives and our choices and, and why we do this work. Great. Thank you. I had a question about uh, special considerations around practice uh, with Aboriginal First Nations people in this work. Yes, well, I think, you know, that's something we're really mindful of. I think um, at the moment we just have one member of the group, so uh, and that's really exciting because we, we didn't previously, so it's something new for us. I think... Um, what is really important and I guess a key element of the work that we do is the tra trauma and violence informed care principles um, and I think that that's really aligned and I think when you get that right um, you, that I think that goes a long way to being really mindful of other people's differences the ways they like to work the things that they're um, sensitive to and as Lily said earlier we ask each weaver to provide us with information about how they would like us to work with them um, so certainly those things come out for, for all different cultural groups in our um, our group around what what works for you how do you like us to communicate what way do you like working best what are the boundaries to the things you will and will not become involved in or interested in speaking about or not interested in speaking about. So I think some of those things do sit nicely. Um, as, you know, we've only just had this person join the group, we haven't established any particular um, supports or different things in the way that we go about things. But I think the approach that we take generally across the board is well suited. Um, but certainly it's something we are thinking about. It'd be great to get um, some other Aboriginal women in, a, you know, part of our group. But at the moment, because we don't have any specific supports, we're mindful of not doing that in a really active way. If, if Aboriginal women want to join the group, they're very, very welcome. Um, but it's not something we're saying we're very well set up for that because there is no there are no um, none of us come from an Aboriginal background that are in the team so we're not putting ourselves out there saying we're offering it but again we're very wel welcoming and inclusive and it's a very inclusive group of women um, so they would be incredibly welcoming and open to that but no we have not at the moment got any particular supports in place um, given it's just a, a new member of the group but I think it's something we definitely should be thinking about um, and speaking to the particular individual about too around this whether there's things that they have noticed, but they've got it, you know, they've only just joined, so they need to settle in a bit to see um, how things run. Great. I have a question about peer research, um, uh, the kind of whether or not it would be possible, for example, um, a weaver as a peer researcher, you know, again, acknowledging all the factors that need to go to, into setting up those sorts of um, engagements, but for a peer researcher to work with an evaluator um in uh for example engaging victim survivors in into projects so they might be um, working together perhaps on things like and i'm not sure of the examples here but i'm thinking about um you know conducting the various things we do in evaluation um you know designing evaluations um conducting methods like uh interviews focus groups surveys you know wh where can the peer researcher role and, and the evaluator relationship work together potentially and all of those places, you know, bring someone in for, you know, your ideation and, and thinking about your planning and your design of the evaluation, help them craft what are your evaluation questions. I mean, they're the perspective that you're going to get from people with lived experience on what actually is meaningful impact, right, is, is probably going to be different than maybe the service provider or maybe a, an evaluative, you know, technical approach. Um yeah, so beyond the participants and, and often the client voice and being involved as uh, a source of knowledge to understand if A equaled B, um, I think as much as possible bring them into the process and share that power and share the determination of the goals and the methods. Yeah, and I think, you know, if people are asking whether they can work with our weavers directly, we do have an external request form on our website at the Safer Families website. We have a, do you want to work with our our co-design team and people can pop in requests there and we can engage on projects. But again, it's not, we don't rent out our weavers survivors. They're, you know, you're engaging with our co-design team with all the wraparound things that we provide. So, um, but that's certainly an option too. And we have lots of evaluators that um, do ask to partner with us. Um, for various projects and elements of the project, there's just a um a request form with a whole lot of questions on our website. So, 
um, people are very welcome to have a look at that and, and to fill that out as a good way of getting in touch if they want to. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to also ask, there's a question here related to this, um, you know, after this presentation today, where can people learn more? Is Are there training opportunities? Are there other ways in which they, um, you know, can engage further with the framework or other resources that you think are really important um, for preparing themselves and their readiness to engage in this kind of work? I think the tools in the framework are a really good starting place. Um, really do, you know, we do take a guided focus on kind of self-assessment of where you're at, where your policies are at, where you're at emotionally as a researcher, where, you know, your institution or organisation is at. So I, I think start there, um, you know, in our highest aspirations for weavers and for, you know, I know the, the work that I lead now professionally with Good Shepherd, we want to develop a suite of all of these wonderful things that people can come and learn. Um, we need co-investment for that. Um, if that's something that evaluators want to do, if there's an opportunity to partner with weavers in developing some of that that's specific, I think that's a great opportunity. Um, and I think, you know, one thing I would love to set up um, in my role as general manager of lived experience and co-production for the Good Shepherd Institute is a future tense like community of practice once we've got our, our process of policy solid. But I think there is a growing group of certainly academics, evaluators, um, people in service delivery who do want to learn more, who are doing the work. And so I think a community of practice would be a good way to help share lessons um, and do some of that more in-depth learning and, and practice reflection. Great. <laughs> really hope we do get that co-investment for you somewhere because it's just so wonderful to just expand on everything you've done with the framework and create, um, you know, opportunities for people to come together and train and reflect and build their practices. That would be, that's, that's an amazing thing for sure. Um, we're just coming to the end here. So um, I just wanted to firstly thank you, um, Katie, uh, Lily, and Lula for joining us. Yes, um, thank you so much for your generosity and for answering questions and providing your great presentation today. Really appreciate it. Um, if there's anything final that you'd like to say, um, feel free. If you wanted to add anything or anything we haven't addressed that you wanted the group to know about before we close. Just think it's fabulous that this many people are interested in this yeah. work. That's really exciting for us. Um, and we're really happy to have conversations with people. If anyone has any follow-up questions or things they think about, always reach out to us. We're pretty easy to find at the Safer Family Centre. So, you know, really welcome people to connect. Great. Thank you so much for that. Thank you again for your presentation. Everyone, thank you for joining us during your lunchtime breaks today. Um, and um, if you're not already a member of the AES, do please consider joining. Um, you'll find that information on the AES website. Um, and please enjoy the rest of your days. Thank you, everyone. <laughs>